Welcome back to another video on the dead internet theory. Consider this a sequel or a companion video to the original. To quickly recap, the basic idea behind the dead internet theory is that the internet as it exists now is empty, devoid of real people, and that the US government is using the power of AI to gaslight the entire world population. Yeah, that's a lot to take in all at once. So if you haven't seen the first video, I highly recommend checking that out. Whereas the first video was a deep dive into what exactly the dead internet theory is, today's video will examine one of the creepiest aspects of it. What is that aspect? Well, it's the concept that the internet is a Potemkin village. To kick things off, let's explain what a Potemkin village is. Merriam-Webster defines a Potemkin village as an impressive facade or show designed to hide an undesirable fact or condition. Let's break it down further. Trust me, all of this matters. Think of a Potemkin village like the set of a movie. There are impressively detailed fake buildings all around with painted walls, decorated rooftops, potted plants, realistic props, and intricate details littered about. In front of this movie set are actors and actresses dressed in period accurate clothing, speaking in accents that fit the time and place. It's all fascinating, realistic looking, and entertaining, but it's fake. It isn't real. What's being shown to you is not reality. Now, if you knew going in that this is a movie set and that most of what you're seeing isn't real, this wouldn't be an issue. But a Potemkin village is made to deceive you. Let's briefly dive into the origins of this phrase. Grigory Potemkin was an 18th century Russian nobleman who, among his good and bad actions in life, allegedly wooed Catherine the Great. During Catherine's 1783 tour of new Russian possessions in the Crimea, Potemkin endeavored to show her and the foreign ambassadors accompanying her the best version of the empire. Apparently, Grigory had built up this grand facade of pretty towns in the distance on riverbanks. At stops, Catherine would be greeted by well-dressed regiments of men and serfs, all dressed up in fanciful garb to show off a grand sense of prosperity that didn't actually exist. In fact, there was a famine going on. My favorite example, though, was the exploding rockets spelling her initials. That was probably quite the sight to see. Now, recent historical evidence has led some to believe at least parts of this tale to be apocryphal or lacking authenticity, despite being believed to be true, but the legend was nonetheless created. The term Potemkin village was set in stone. It signifies any deceptive or false construct, conjured often by cruel regimes to deceive both those within the land and those peering in from outside. We're getting close, but before we connect all the dots and show off the big reveal, we need to talk about internet rot. It's a pretty gross name, right? The internet is 25 years old now and was originally meant to be a place where information and knowledge could be transcribed, shared, and enjoyed with a worldwide audience. The concept is that information would stack. The more that got added on, the more it would grow. A potentially limitless amount of human knowledge right there at your fingertips, ready to be absorbed. I mean, the internet has grown exponentially since the 1990s. This concept still must hold true, right? I mean, has anyone ever honestly questioned that growth? What if in fact the internet is actually shrinking and that shrinking can be broken down into two specific things, content drift and link rot. Hyperlinks are the glue of the internet. Think about it. Anytime you click a link, it takes you somewhere else. Well, that's a hyperlink. Without hyperlinks, the internet wouldn't work. Content drift is when the web page you are trying to access through a hyperlink has been moved. It still exists, it just exists somewhere else. This can be caused by a number of different issues, but the potential to solve this connection problem is there and can be solved with some effort. That is content drift. The bigger and scarier issue is link rot. Link rot is the phenomenon of hyperlinks over time ceasing to point to their original target due to that resource becoming permanently unavailable, meaning the information or the results that you wanted simply aren't there anymore. Did you know back in 2013, it was discovered that 49% of links cited in Supreme Court cases are broken. Meaning if you go back and try and read through all of those cases and decisions, nearly half of the hyperlinks do not work anymore. This isn't like some small fan site you enjoyed as a teenager being shut down over the years. These are links cited and used in Supreme Court cases, the highest level of decision making in the United States, and they don't exist anymore. And this was back in 2013. I'm sure that number is much higher now. In three legal journals, the Harvard Law Review, the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, and the Harvard Human Rights Journal, 70% of links no longer work. This isn't just a problem, it's endemic, meaning it's so common and so prevalent that it can't be dealt with easily. These two terms, content drift and link rot, combine together to make up the term internet rot. 
It's the fading away of the overwhelming vast majority of the internet. So when I say that the internet is dead, I don't just mean that the majority of people online are bots and aren't real. I also mean that most of the internet is dead, thanks to internet rot. Surely this is just the result of a natural cycle of older content getting relocated or removed and newer content taking its place, and links simply not getting updated, right? Well, it turns out it actually gets worse, much worse. You now understand the terminology and the history behind the phrase Potemkin Village, as well as the concept of internet rot, but how does it all come together? The answer to that is Google. Google is a Potemkin Village. Do a quick Google search, and within a second you'll receive a fancy facade of seemingly endless information instantly appearing before your very eyes. Incredible, right? Eh, uh, let's check it out. First you need a basic search term to show off what I mean, and it can be whatever you want. How about pizza? That's simple enough. When you search pizza with Google, you are instantly given, at the time of this video, over a billion results in 1.02 seconds. That's incredible, right? I can't wait to dig through a billion plus links to pizza and discover all there is to find out. If you count the number of results on page one, you'll see that there are nine results. That's not a lot of links right off the bat, but I guess they don't want to overwhelm you with too much pizza knowledge. Nine results on the first page. That's fine. Let's go to page two. Nearly the same as page one, this time we got 10 results in less than a second. If you were like most people today, you probably wouldn't dig any deeper than this. Usually you can find what you're looking for on the first page or the second page of results, or you kind of give up. But we're on a quest for knowledge, so we have to go deeper. When we hit page 3, it's the exact same. Billions more results to go, with 10 results on the page. Same with page 4, and 5. But when I got to page 6, something weird happened. Somehow the results for pizza jumped up to 1,340,000,000 from 1,050,000,000. Did Google just discover 290 million extra pizza results between clicks? On page 24, Google still says we have 1,340,000,000 results to go. The next weird anomaly doesn't happen until page 25. It instantly drops to 1,210,000,000. I'm sorry, but where did those extra 130 million results go? It's crazy how hundreds of millions of results are appearing and disappearing, moving and shifting around so quickly and so easily. Going by the math of 9 results on page 1 and 10 results on page 2 to 25, we have only seen 249 results for pizza up to this point. The rest of the pages showed the same result of 1,340,000,000 until we got to the final page. What was the final page? I mean, it had to be an insanely high number to show all the billion plus results, right? Wrong. It's page 35. On page 35, the facade completely breaks apart and reveals the total number of results listed as 348. That's 348 results for pizza total. As in everything Google has listed when it comes to pizza web results, 348. What? What happened to the other 1,340,000,000 results? Where did they go? Why does Google say that they have over a billion results when they clearly don't? Something isn't right here. Is Google a Potemkin village? Is Google showing off an intentionally deceptive high number to impress you, when in reality it's actually hiding the true number until after you've gone through 35 whole pages? Wait a second, let's step back, let's be rational about this. Before we get all crazy, at the bottom of the page Google says, in order to show you the most relevant results, we have omitted some entries very similar to the 348 already displayed. If you like, you can repeat the search with omitted results included. Okay, everything makes sense now, that seems to be the problem. I guess the 1,340,000,000 results were very similar to the 348 that were displayed. If I was a simple man, I'd say, okay, that makes sense and move on with my life. But I'm not a simple man. I'm a man that demands answers when it comes to pizza. I want Google to repeat the search with the omitted results included. And wow, when you include the omitted results, you get a staggering 1,900,000,000 results for pizza. That's 560,000,000 more results than originally promised. They found an extra 560 million pizza results. I'm sure this time Google will absolutely give me all the results it promotes. I went through everything and Google gave us an unimpressive 53 pages. Now at the top of the page, it still says 1,900,000,000 results, but I did the math so you wouldn't have to. In actuality, Google gave us 529 results, most of which by the end had nothing to do with pizza. How can the most widely used search engine in the world only have 529 total results about one of the most popular foods in the world? It doesn't make sense. In fact, others have already done this experiment and came up with similar results. 
Climate change, one of the most widely discussed major issues of our time, with 60 years of research behind it, only has 438 total results. What? How? What about football? A whopping 462 results on page 47. How about aliens? That's another subject with an unbelievable amount of research, footage, and discussion around it. How many results does it have? 146. You can do this test with anything and the results are always the same. Google is a Potemkin village. It's a facade. It's pretending to be something big and grand, and there's nothing behind it. When you really stop and think about this, it's immensely troubling. It's been in front of us the entire time, but seemingly no one noticed it. And they're really clever with how they do this. First you see a really big number, then the pages and pages of results, then the comforting message that assures you that some of the results have been omitted. After that, when you hit the final page, it essentially means the end of the line. What's really interesting to me though are the dates of most of these results, especially when it comes to important topics. There is next to nothing before 2016. The few that there are are from government websites, university research branches, or scientific publications, but noticeably missing are the personal blogs, web pages, any content created by individuals not affiliated with the media, a corporation, or government. It's really strange. So what in the world happened to all of the billions and billions of pages of content that people have created over the years? Is it all just internet rot? That can't possibly explain it all, can it? Are they actually still there somewhere in the background, but for some reason inaccessible through Google search? Or are they really just gone? We need to ask ourselves, why would Google want everyone to think that there are hundreds of millions if not billions more results out there than there actually are? The sole purpose of a Potemkin village is to provide an external facade to a country which is faring poorly, making people believe that the country is actually faring much better than it is. Is Google Search the foundational product for a company worth $1.6 trillion as of July 2021? Just a Potemkin village? And if it is a Potemkin village, who is this all for? Is it to fool the shareholders? The US government? Corporations? Google? The internet as a whole? I'm sure some of you watching at this point have said, just use a different search engine. Sounds simple enough, but here's the problem. Just about every private search engine out there uses either Google or Bing as a proxy. Not to mention the stranglehold Google has over the web search market. When it comes to cell phones, 94.1% are made using Google search. This is the exact opposite of a decentralized and open internet. The days of discovering random websites with just a search are over. Google has been heavily censoring content for years, and it's more than just a search result here and a search result there. There are tons of examples of this online. Pulling results because of DMCA claims of piracy, then the right to be forgotten, where the rich and powerful can scrub any mention of their wrongdoings from the media and search engines under the guise of anti-harassment. Then you have the tweaking of Google results based on layers and layers of new algorithms Google created. Initially, Google's intent was seemingly innocent, Try to anticipate what people are actually looking for and give them better results. I mean, that sounds helpful. Google's algorithms would dig through mountains of results and start refining search so people could get more relevant results faster. The problems began once they started tweaking the base search results without being transparent, without warning, and without any way to opt out. It didn't stay at serve the user better. The tweaks were used almost immediately to start selling ads. And once Google decided it was the arbiter of information, it turned this power full force against anyone and everyone that didn't play ball. Don't be evil has been a part of Google's corporate code of conduct since 2000. And I think for a giant corporation, that's a great way to conduct business. Don't be evil. It sounds very self-explanatory. Then Google was reorganized under a new parent company, Alphabet. And in 2015, Alphabet created a slightly adjusted version of the motto. Instead of don't be evil, it became do the right thing. You'd assume that by not being evil, you would be doing the right thing. But it's those little subtle nuances that tell you everything you need to know. Google is a Potemkin village and the internet is rotting away. Decades of lost information is kept from us behind powerful gatekeepers, while billions of internet pages filled with anything and everything are being lost to time and rot. Imagine if millions of physical books all over the world just started dissolving away the very ink on all of their remaining worldly pages evaporating and becoming unreadable. All the digital copies of those books become corrupted and unsalvageable. 
Imagine a world where this is happening and no one has really noticed it. No one seems to talk about it and no one is seemingly bothered by it. I'm not saying everything disappearing has inherent value, but surely some of it does, right? Like all forms of entertainment, preservation matters so much because it's our history. It's our culture. Before the days of writing and record keeping, so much of our history has been lost. In the early days of cinema, so much of that footage has been lost. In the early days of music and audio recordings, so much has been lost. When it comes to video games, shut down online games and interactive media, so much has been lost, permanently. And here we are for the millionth time doing the exact same thing. It's the case of all of us living today and thinking about the future, but not taking a step back to see how important the past was. So what can we do to save this? Honestly, not as much as you'd think. First of all, using a different search engine, well, that's one attempt. Using the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine is another way to store digital web pages for the future. If you've never used that site before, I highly recommend it. It's got all kinds of internet sites digitally captured in the past and you can return to them today and look at them. It's nowhere near even close to being complete, but it's one of the only practical ways we have to preserve dead or dying websites and hyperlinks. It's also a great way to spend an afternoon being nostalgic. Go check up on your Neopets, I'm sure they miss you. Another thing you can do is upload any digital media you still have or can find to the Internet Archive. You can go on there now and explore years worth of archived content for free. Old books, films, songs, magazines, TV ads, internet video clips. Add to it, enjoy it, go check it out. I'm going to have links to all of these things in the description. The Dead Internet Theory 2. What did you think about all this? Again, this is just building upon a theory and what you choose to believe is up to you. Was this all too much to take in? Or is it yet again another chilling reminder that we really aren't in control of anything? If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share this video. I know everyone hates hearing that, but it really does help, and I would greatly appreciate it. If you have the means and the desire to, you can support me over on Patreon, where everyone got to watch this video early, as well as all of my videos, plus exclusive videos only for patrons. I add new stuff every single month. Also, if you have any good suggestions for upcoming video topics or ideas, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say, and I'm down to explore whatever you all want. Until next time. Never stop searching.